Southside Community Church. And uh, there we go. <laughs> heard, uh, heard a brother say one time, can you, can you put a little bit more anointing on this mic? <laughs> it needed it right there. As much as somebody and the devil would like to mute me, you know. No, I'm playing. I'm playing up there. I'm playing. But no, good to see them with us tonight. And good to have everybody out here tonight. Had a lot of visitors this morning. And it's, it's just good to see people coming out to the house of God. Especially with the way times are getting today. You, you just can't, you can't be thankful enough for what God has blessed us with here in America and grateful to have, as I said uh, a couple nights ago, just testified, thankful that we've got a house of God and leadership in the house of God that has a desire to keep the doors of God's house open. Amen. 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 That's something that we, uh, that we take all too much for granted. There's a lot of people, I, I'm telling you, I believe, they just, they just look for an excuse. At, at the first excuse they get, buddy, those doors are closed. They can sit back, watch their football games, whatever you want. You all know all too well how I feel about that stuff. I think excuses, excuses, and Jesus talked about how no excuse will stand on Judgment Day. Amen. But uh, the Lord gave me a word for tonight. And if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and uh, open up to Romans chapter 7. I'll tell you what verse here in just a minute. But throughout the scriptures, our adversary, the devil, has... Many, many different names. Of course, we, we know his name as a, a cherubim was Lucifer. And we know him as Satan, the adversary. We know him as the devil. We know him as that old serpent. But he also has one other name that stood out to me that was very clear. And that is accuser of the brethren. Accuser of the brethren. And uh, I'll, I'll say this before I jump into the message. I, I feel so much as if I come up here, especially with the last time that I preached here, I come up with abrasive messages that God's placed on my heart because we live in such a day and such an age that they, they've just completely hardened their hearts against God. And unless God break that heart again and sow that seed of the gospel into it, it's most likely not to penetrate, but the Word of God is still quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. But I, I realize so much that in, in the minds and the eyes of some, I, I hate to think that I would just ever come off as just controversial and abrasive, even though one of my most favorite compliments that I've ever received from anybody was that I'm abrasively truthful. Uh, I, I, I consider it a compliment, strangely enough. But... I do. I have such a care and I have such a love in my heart, not only for God, but also for you. And, and thank God today he finally flipped the script with me a little bit and I get, to, I get to preach on something other than get your wretched sin out of the way, which you need to do, by the way. But the Lord has placed this on my heart because knowing the adversary that we've got, the Bible says in one place that he who hardeneth his heart betimes is destroyed suddenly and that without remedy. So there's, there comes a point with so many people that you can preach and you can preach and you can give them hellfire and brimstone and the judgment of God. And the Bible says even in the book of Jude that some save with fear, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh, pulling them from the fire but some people that just won't reach. And with others it says they make a difference having compassion. And, and I always prayed, God let me be that light. Let me be that witness that can stand before men and women regardless of what they're caught up in, regardless of if they're straight or gay or lesbian or trans or if they're adulterers or murderers. I've had to stand before them all. And you think I'm kidding. I've worked in the prison system. I've stood before them all. I've had to witness to a man who killed a young boy that I witnessed to. And thank God through his spirit, I was able to drop the grudge and reach out still with love and compassion 
in my heart towards a man who had done utter wrong in his life. And I always prayed, God, let me be that balance. And thank God I, I actually get to bring something different tonight because I don't, I don't relish in those times that I have to stand up here and just be abrasive. I promise you that. God, God get the glory and all that he give me, but, but I, I thank God for the, for the word tonight. But if you've got your Bibles and have turned to Romans chapter 7 with me, we'll start in verse 18. It says, as the Apostle Paul speaks to us, it says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Anybody ever find themselves in a situation like this before? I've been there. I remain there to this present day. There are many things that I would like to do in my walk with God. There are many things that I, that I feel led and compelled to do and instructed to do by these holy scriptures. And I have every single intention, every thought within my mind to do that which is right in the sight of God. But for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I just can't find. I want to do right, but there's something that's against me, something that keeps driving me to do the things and the works of the old man. Paul's about to lay out plain and clear what this is. Verse 19, it says, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Understand, fellow brothers and sisters, I believe I, I've got the right word for the right night with the, with the right congregation. Because there's so many of us that are wrestling and we're struggling and we're toiling with what God desires and craves out of us. But we find ourselves in a wrestling match with not only the devil, but with the natural innate desires of our flesh. And I come to you with a word today that I pray will be able to loose you and set you free. If God so have power today, I believe He's able to do it. And God is mighty from here forevermore, always has been, always will be. But He goes on to say, 23, But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man am I, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Has anybody in here ever beat themselves up to the point of just complete sorrow and failure over what they knew they should be doing for God? but they just seem to have missed the mark utterly. Amen. I have. I have. And I want, to, I want to tell you this real quick. In 23, I want to focus on this because I don't believe it's focused on nearly enough and I see so many people struggling and wrestling with this very thing and realize that it's even been within me. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity. We know that the Apostle Paul would write to Timothy, he said that the Word of God is not bound. Absolutely not bound. And that Word, the Bible says in John chapter 1, in the beginning the Word was God. And it was with God. Let me tell you that word of God is Jesus Christ. And let me tell you that if you are a blood-bought, born-again Christian today, that that word of God dwells and resides within each and every single one of you, regardless of what the, the warfare of your flesh and of your mind and of the enemy and all of these things outwardly that are affecting you inwardly makes it seem you 
you are free and free indeed. That word of God is not bound and if it be within you, have faith in God that you are not bound. You're not slaves. You're not captives. No, not to anything, but you are free and free indeed. Amen. Amen. But you see here, what happens is when we get taken to these places in our mind, the devil seems to take that magnifying glass and lay it upon our failures. The places in which we've messed up. The places in which we knew that we ought to have done better and we just completely disregarded what we knew God would want to do. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul was saying. For the good that I would do, that's not what I'm doing. But the evil which I would not do, that's what I do. A wretched man am I. Anybody ever feel wretched in here? I have felt unworthy, unacceptable in the eyes of God. But thank God that where sin did abound, grace doth more abound. Thank God today for His grace. You wouldn't believe how many times as ministers, no doubt pastors, preachers, singers, evangelists, whatever you may be out there today in whatever calling it is, we have all probably felt unworthy of the call of God in our lives. But we thank God today that His grace is sufficient for each and every single one of us. But... Look at that name that I threw out of the devil to you earlier, accuser of the brethren. I want to tell you today that so many people think, well, you know, I, it's, a, it's a good thing for me to be completely broken over my sins. You ought to be sorry when you sin against God. You ought to be remorseful when you miss the mark in following after God. But you watch and you see if that devil doesn't take that magnifying glass and put it to a place where you're beating yourself up and you're just staying down and not rising up in repentance and turning unto God anymore, but you're just there wallowing in defeat. This is where the devil begins to work. The accuser of the brethren, the one who continues to whisper you're not good enough. The one who continues to say, you might as well not speak up. Nobody wants to hear you. They are done with you. They have nothing but hatred and spite against you. You're not doing any good. You're not making the least little impact. You might as well shut up. You might as well shut the podcast down, Candy. You might as well stop singing out there, Diane. You might as well stop preaching, Brother Rob, because nobody wants to hear you the accuser of the brethren and when it's something that desires to snuff that call of God out in your life you better believe it's under a spiritual attack and that's something that you need to shake off right quick off of you because it's trying to bring you into captivity he said it right there there's, there's another law warring against the law here in my mind. And it says it's bringing me into captivity. And I see too many Christians in captivity of the devil. Turn with me uh, real quick to the book of uh, 2 Timothy. And it's going to be in verse 26. We'll start in 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. You would not believe how much as a, as a minister we have to deal with this within our congregations. We have to be very <laughs> gentle, <laughs> Because how many of you know it's uh, very easy to just fly off in the flesh and say, what's wrong with you? Are you stupid? You, you're not doing what the pastor told you this morning. You're not looking at Isaiah. You're not keeping your mind rooted within the Word. And that's why your, your life's in turmoil, you idiot. That wouldn't fly over too well. Some of you would it. 
My goodness, that's about how it does in the flesh sometimes. But you've got to be very, very gentle Amen. unto all men. And you're going to have to apply this in your lives no matter where you think you stand within the body of Christ with those around you. You will have to be, uh, learn, learn to be gentle. And it says, apt to teach and patient. We've got to be patient with so many people because... It says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. People within this very congregation are involved in things that are opposing themselves. That's impacting themselves. Yes. That's setting themselves up as a target for the enemy to bring them back into captivity. And why does it say that we do this? It says, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. This is before salvation, but we find so many, so many people within the church that are allowing themselves to be taken captive again. How do I know that this happens? It happened in the book of Galatians. In the book of Galatians in chapter 4, the apostle Paul tells them, My children in whom I travail in birth again. I've got to come here and I've got to preach the same message to you again because you've fallen captive to the enemy in which in times past you were delivered from. Don't be taken captive by the enemy any longer to let him hold that magnifying glass over your failures and bring you into condemnation because that's exactly what I'm about to point out. That's what the devil does. He wants to take the weight of your condemnation and he wants you to look at your failures. He wants to look at you, your shortcomings. He wants you to look at your incapabilities, the things that you're poor at, the things that you see others excelling in, and the things that you wish you could do. But rather, he wants you to feel the weight of all of these things instead of seeing the cause and the purpose and the things that God has blessed you with, that you're able to be a blessing to God and to others with, and that you excel at where the others that you're looking at, quite frankly, miss the mark at. Let me tell you that there are so many ways that the devil is taking people captive in their minds. And so we have to be there to instruct those that are following it. Let me, let me turn real quick to, to Galatians chapter 6. This right here just hit me like a ton of bricks because we've got so many people going about this the wrong way. The Bible says in or Galatians 6, 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, overtaken, he's fallen into adultery. He's fallen into fornication. And if it, look at that. It says, if they be overtaken in it. Listen, I'm telling you, that can happen right in the church. That can happen in the church. It says, ye which are spiritual, go ahead and talk down on them. That ain't what it says. Go ahead and ridicule them in the church. Go ahead and backbite and murmur and talk evil of them behind their backs. That ain't what the Word says. Ye which are spiritual... Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. It's all about working towards the benefit of the body, pleasing that he who which is the head, Jesus Christ the righteous. Us moving in accordance with the holy word of God. And to do so, we cannot backbite, we cannot gossip, we cannot deride others. Let me tell you, but rather that we should reach out with the love of God and restore these ones that are fallen. Yes, there is a repentance process that must must take place. There is a confession, a, a prayer that needs to be prayed within that heart that is fallen. But we must be patient. We must be willing to reach continually to those that the world has given up on and quite frankly some of the church has given up on because that person may have very well have given up on themselves. But God hasn't. I don't believe he has. 
so many people talking about the reprobate mind and this and that. I never saw one of you be right about somebody that's been turned over just yet. I heard one preacher talk about one man. He said, God told me that he turned him over. He was caught up in all kinds of things. The man was in his 20s. <laughs> Golly, imagine that. Where would I have been? What would he have thought of me? Let me tell you where the boy's at now. He's married. He's got a couple of children. And he's in a church there in West Liberty. Thank God. I'm not about to give up on anybody because I was that very person that somebody else could have given up on. And I've been the very person. Let me get back on track. There's your, little, there's your little rabbit trail from me. And I've been the very one to be taken captive. You see, and it's by condemnation that he does so many things. And there's unnecessary weights that we can place upon others to make them feel further condemned than what they are. Because, look at this with me real quick. That verse in 23, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. It talked about the devil taking them captive, it did in Timothy, at his own will. We were all captives of the devil at one time, ransomed by the blood of Christ, ripped from the hands of he who held us captive and set free. We know that some go back unto that bondage. And that's why Paul had to say, I travail you in birth again. But you see today, there is something about shaking free in repentance. I know that we shake free from the devil in repentance, but I know that so many people begin to fall in their times of failure and they enter into that condemnation that the devil places upon them, the accuser of the brethren. And I want to tell you today that if you're dealing with condemnation upon your very soul and your heart and it's affecting you, some of you even physically, because of the things that you're busy beating yourself up over, that if the devil can condemn you, he can capture you. And if he can capture you, he can make you feel hopeless. He can make you feel beyond redemption because you've tasted it before. And look at where you're at now. Let me tell you, the Bible is full of examples of people that have walked firmly with God and stood for His holy commandments and have fallen from grace and redeemed to glory again. And let me tell you, if you've fallen into condemnation today, if you feel as if you've been captured and held captive by the devil, I want to tell you today that you can still shake free, that you can still flip the script on the devil. Verse 24, Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death. Skip down to Romans 8, 1. It says, there is therefore, as the light clicks in the apostle's head, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And if you turn over with me to Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, for though we walk in the flesh, verse 3, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. He's saying, I'm going to flip the script on my own feelings, on my own emotions, on my own problems. I'm going to flip the script on the devil and all the condemnation that he's laying upon my soul. You've taken me captive in times past, but today in the name of Jesus, I take you captive and I gain my freedom once again. Amen. Amen. You see, 
As much as the enemy wants to hold you captive, he cannot hold you any longer than what you and God allow. I believe that we have God-given authority of the Holy Ghost over every unclean spirit. That means a spirit that will hold you down in oppression, that will hold you down in depression, that will hold you down in hopelessness and sorrow and bitterness and lust. I believe in a God that can cause us to excel in glory and victory. I believe in a mighty God who's able not just to break the yokes but to destroy them. Big difference between something that's broken and something that's destroyed. If it's broken, it can be mended back together. You can weld it back together. You can form it back together so that it can be used against you again. But if you destroy that thing, it can never be used against you again. And that's the power that there is in the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God that dwells within you if you would just learn the gift of God that is given you and walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Understand how to war after this warfare that is mighty to the pulling down of strongholds that you've had in your flesh for so long that caused you to run to immorality, that caused you to look to pornography, that caused you to commit fornication, that caused you to go back unto the old life of drinking, of smoking, of hopelessness. There's freedom from all of these things. Amen. And how do we war after this warfare? You're going to have to surrender as we've talked about so much. These things of carnality. You're going to have to give up some of the hobbies because you're going to realize that it's keeping you, keeping you held down. You're just going to have to dedicate is exactly what it's going to take. There was a place in my life where I was afraid to pray for something because I knew that the fight th that was about to come when I began to pray for it. And then the Lord revealed to me after I went months without praying for it when every time I got down to pray, God was placing it on my heart and I'd ignore it. One day God let me know all too well. He said, you might as well go ahead and pray because right now you're still miserable with what you're running from. You've turned your back on this. You're turning your back on the fight. You're turning your back on the war and the war's raging all around you. You're right in the thick of it. You're right in the middle of it and it's about time that you pull out that sword of God that is the word. Take up that shield of faith that goes before you put on the whole armor of God so that you're able to withstand the wiles of the devil and fight against that enemy and get the victory over it because you can try to ignore it. You can try to turn a blind eye all you want but it's all around you. The Bible says there is a time of peace and there is a time of war and let me tell you that there is one designated from the other for a reason. There's no sense in you saying that you're in a time of peace if you know good and well that you're in a time of war. And you know good and well that if you're in a time of war, you have to gird yourself and stand firm and fight that good fight of faith because you know that at the end of that thing, at the end of that race, there is laid up a crown of righteousness whom the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give you and all of those that love His appearing, those that fight that good fight of faith shall be comforted and you might be in that season of war right now, but praise God, that season of peace is on its way. You already quoted it, brother. The weeping endure for a night. Joy cometh in the morning. Amen. Amen. You see, it's more than just, more than just some resolution that you're going to make, but you must come to that point of making the resolution within your mind, I'm tired of it. I'm sick of it. I'm done. I'm done being held captive. I'm, I, I'm, I'm done being controlled and letting the devil make me the puppet of my own emotions. I'm done with it all. 
I'm turning my whole heart. I'm turning my mind into this word of God because thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Wherein shall a young man cleanse his ways but there by the word of God. It's more than just a resolution. It's the redeeming power of God's grace that he wants to show to you. If they'd come to get a song tonight, whoever's got something on their heart, let me tell you, whoever's got the weight lying upon your shoulders, whoever feels as if they've been taken captive, beat up and failed the Lord so many times, His grace is sufficient for you. His grace is sufficient for you. I can't tell you how many times I've failed God. It's been so many that, that, that I cannot even number. But I know that the thoughts of God are more towards me and you and all of these others out there than there are sand on the shores of the sea. And knowing this, it gives me all the confidence, though in my shame, in my regrets... I have to kneel before Him, sometimes broken, sometimes empty, sometimes battered, sometimes hopeless. I kneel before Him, sometimes fearful and sometimes afraid. And when I go before Him, filled with all of these things, that I begin to pour out upon Him, knowing that I can cast my cares upon Him for He cares for me, knowing that I, I can't just hide them from Him because He knows them already. Why have I ever run? Why have I ever hid? Why have I ever tried to draw myself away from Him and let the devil isolate me in that place where He'll consume me and bring me captive again? Instead of running back to where I first found freedom. Instead of returning to my first love that I had left. And letting Him redeem me out of the mess I've made for myself. Or even the mess that I found myself in that I cannot control. And find that He would strengthen me. In those times of hopelessness, He would give me hope. In those times of weakness, that He would give me strength. In that time of mourning, He'd give me joy. In that time of depression, He'd allow me to feel peace once again. If you feel as if the weights have been upon you today, won't you do as the Apostle Paul did? You might feel the war of, of of your mind coming against coming against you, bringing you into captivity. But won't you flip the script today on the devil? Won't you flip the script today on even your own understanding and get the victory and take captive by the power of God through the power that there is in the prayer of faith that shall not only heal the sick but forgive the sins of those that have committed it, that can restore joy unto those those that are hopeless. Won't you come today and lay it all down before the Lord. Walk in revival. Walk in that victory and have the upper hand on what is to come. Jesus told us of all things to come and He said, I told you of these things so that when they do come, that you might not be offended, that you might not be overtaken by them. Understand there's hard times to come. But through these times, we can be a people with our eyes lifted unto the heavens, watching for our redemption, for it draweth nigh. My friends, if you've got the weights upon you, I know a God that's able to lift them. Amen. You can come and you can find restoration in your soul tonight. You can have your own personal revival within your heart and soul. Let's just pour it all out before Him. Pastor, come on. What a powerful message. Praise God. If you can, would you stand with us tonight?
If you need, come pray. Come on, please. Come pray. Come pray. Come pray. Amen. Guilt settles on us. Uh, amen. And all kinds of things. And we just don't feel worthy. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've come here. And, God, I'm not worthy. And the Lord would tell me you never was. <laughs> never was. But you know what he does? He makes you worthy. Through him, he makes you worthy. Your worth is not in your abilities. It's in Jesus Christ. Your worth is in Jesus Christ. It's not in your bank. It's not in anything. It's in Jesus. Amen. Jesus makes you worthy. He's the one who makes you worthy. That's where your worth comes from. Amen. That's where it comes from. And you come pray. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. What a beautiful message. It's true, you know. They will keep you wallowing in that as long as he can. You got to get up out of the hog pen alive. <laughs> Amen. You got to get up out of that and come to yourself, right? Hey, in my father's house. <laughs> Amen. Aren't you glad the prodigal son gives us that? He gives that to, and he came to himself. Amen. You can come to yourself. But yeah, you usually, what was it? Man, he was flat broke. Come to the bottom. How many hit the bottom before you realize, amen, where you need to go? Yeah, hit the bottom, amen. Ain't no word to look but up. But I thank God that he allows us to hit the bottom in our life. He allows you to also. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Thank God. Anybody else need to come pray? Come on, come on, come on. Don't, don't take this stuff. Don't carry this stuff. You don't have to. You don't have to carry it. Give it to Jesus. That's why I said, take my yoke. Right? Take my yoke. Learn of me. Amen? Anybody else? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Surrender it all to the Lord. Surrender it all. Isn't that a... Aren't you glad he made that? That's a peaceful place. Or you can find that. And God opened that place up so that you can surrender stuff to Him. You can surrender to Him. Give it to Him. That you don't have to carry it. Then you can get up, serve the Lord, right? Get up with praise upon your lips. Get up with joy in your heart. Amen. Get up with happiness. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. And the world will see. Amen, the joy in your life. That's why David had to come to a place and said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Praise God. Because he had hit the bottom. <laughs> he had hit it. He messed up. Thank God that the Lord heard his prayer and forgave his sin. He said he put his sin away, didn't he? He said, the old prophet said, God has put your sin away. You'll not die. <laughs> Because that's what the wages of sin is. Death. Right? That's what it is. Still is. Thank God for a Savior. Thank God for a Savior. Thank God for a Savior. Anybody else? Anybody else? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to go home. If, you're going to, if you continue to carry this, if you want to continue to carry this, you know, some people think they need to, and this is from Catholicism, they think they need to punish themselves. Penance. That's not, no. <laughs> they, they, they want to beat themselves up because I messed up. I need to be beating myself up. I need to suffer this for a while. That's not the word of God. Jesus suffered it already on a cross on a hill called Calvary. Amen. So do you don't have to suffer it. Praise God. So don't belittle what he did on a hill. Praise God. And try to carry it yourself. Amen. You give it to the Lord. But if you, you insist on carrying it, then when you get home, look in a mirror. And I want you to see the only reason you're carrying it. It's you. You're the only reason. It's not your husband's fault it's not your wife's fault it's not your children's fault it's not your circumstances it's you because you're fully able if you're a child of God to bow down on your knees or in your heart and cry out to God and surrender it to him amen
Amen.